Welcome back to Winning Souls for Christ, a radio show designed to teach, equip, and empower you for the mission of the new evangelization. I'm your host, Isaac Longworth. Today, we're going to be talking about how we can use social media to spread the gospel. Now, due to the invention of the internet and the resulting explosion of new social media sites, I have found that the new evangelization must necessarily take advantage of every single technological means at our disposal in order to reach as many people with the good news as we can. This is what Pope Benedict XVI taught. He wrote that the world of digital communications with its almost limitless expressive capacity makes us appreciate all the more St. Paul's exclamation, woe to me, if I do not preach the gospel. The increased availability of these new technologies demands greater responsibility on the part of those called to proclaim the word, but it also requires them to become more focused, efficient, and compelling in their efforts. So what Benedict XVI is saying here is that the world of digital communications, social media, has opened up to us an entire new audience that we can reach with the gospel and we shouldn't let it go to waste. However, in order to do this, in order to proclaim the word on social media, we need to become more focused and efficient in how we go about it. And so with this in mind, today's show is going to focus, first of all, on why we need to use social media as an avenue to spread the gospel. And secondly, how we can do this in an effective way. So first of all, why should we use social media to evangelize? And second, how do we use social media to evangelize? So first of all, why? Well, the why is because Jesus commanded his disciples from the very beginning to proclaim the gospel to the whole of creation, telling everyone the good news. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole of creation. Preach the gospel. Preach the good news that God created us to be in a relationship with him, that he loves us, that he wants to spend eternity with us. But that because of our sin, because of our rebellion towards him, we had broken our relationship with God. And as a result, we had earned death for ourselves, physical death in this life and spiritual death in the next. And so God sent his son, Jesus, to enter into our world, to take on flesh, to suffer and die for us on the cross, rise again from the dead so that we could be reunited and brought back into right relationship with God as long as we accept this free gift of salvation, turn away from our sin, put our faith in the Lord Jesus and become united with his church. This is the good news that we are called to share. And if you notice, right away, the disciples are obedient to this command of Jesus to go and evangelize, and they do so in various means. They begin evangelizing one-on-one, -on -one, like for instance, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch going into his chariot one-on-one -on -one and explaining who Jesus is. We also see evangelization happening in small groups that had been brought together for that purpose. Like for instance, in Acts chapter 10, when Peter goes to Cornelius's home and Cornelius has brought together his friends and his family to hear the gospel and Peter preaches to them. So we see evangelization happening in different ways. But one of the main things that we see the apostles doing is going out into the streets, into the public places to preach the gospel to all who are passing by. That's what it says Paul did in Acts chapter 17, verse 17. It says he went out into the marketplace every day with those who chanced to be there. So he's not going to a select group. He's not going one-on-one. -on -one. He's going into the public place to announce the gospel to any random person walking by. Now, in order to understand why this is significant, we need to understand what the marketplace, or in Greek, the agora, meant to people at the time. 
for them, the Agora, the marketplace, was the center hub of what was happening in the city. It was in the Agora that commerce took place, that people would open their shops and sell their wares. It was the place of politics. It was where all the important things that were going to be happening in the city were discussed and debated. It was where the emperor would send his messengers to make major announcements. And so because of this, it was also the place for people who were bored or looking for something to do would go to the Agora, would go to the marketplace to buy things, to see what was being discussed, to see the ideas that were taking place, to learn different philosophies. Now, where am I going with this? What does the marketplace and the evangelization of the apostles in it mean for our use of social media today? Well, Pope Benedict XVI said that the marketplace of the old time is like social media for our current time. This is what he wrote. I wish to consider the development of digital social networks, which are helping to create a new agora, an open public square in which people share ideas, information, and opinions. So Pope Benedict XVI is saying, the social media world that we live in is the new marketplace. On social media, you will find constant traffic of people with different viewpoints, different cultures, different religions, just like the marketplace of the apostles' time. Just like the marketplace of the apostles' time, we see people going there to be updated on new ideas. They go to social media to waste time, to hang out with their friends. And so when we use social media to evangelize, it is very similar to what the apostles were doing when they would go out into the public marketplace to announce the gospel of Jesus to everyone who is passing by, whether they were expecting it or not. Now, this isn't something new. This isn't something that I came up with. Using technology to advance the gospel is something that has always been happening in the life of the church. And one of the best examples of this, in my opinion, is St. Maximilian Kolbe. He's a Polish priest who many people know about because of his awesome witness of being taken to a Nazi concentration camp and offering up his life in exchange for a fellow prisoner. But what many people don't know about St. Maximilian Kolbe is that he was an evangelist par excellence because he would use all of the technology available to him at that time to share the good news. St. Maximilian Kolbe and his brothers had a radio show. They had a high-tech printing press, the best that they could afford to print and distribute materials about Our Lady, about the church, to other people. They even had plans for a movie studio to distribute Catholic film, which unfortunately did not come about because they were arrested by the Nazis and taken away before they could accomplish this. So St. Maximilian Kolbe understood the importance of using technology to advance the gospel. And we need to do the same. In order to fill Jesus's mandate to preach the gospel to all people, we need to use every tool at our disposal, and that includes social media. Well, hopefully I've convinced you of the necessity of using social media for the work of the new evangelization, but your next question, if you've stuck with me this long, is to say, well, Isaac, how do we do that? How do we use social media effectively to share the gospel? Well, here's some tips on how to do this. If you're going to start trying to share your Catholic faith online, the first thing you're going to want to do is choose the content that you're going to put up wisely. So for instance, if you are writing a Facebook post, I would highly advise getting someone you trust to look over your post to see if you've missed anything. Because one of the main problems with social media is that sometimes people misread your posts in a way that you didn't intend. And so if you get someone who you trust, who you know understands the faith, to look over your work, they can show you what your work looks like from a different angle so that you can avoid this. So it's very important that we post wisely and with prudence. 
Another thing that is very important for effective evangelization through social media is to try to diversify your content. Try not to harp on one thing over and over and over again, even if it's a good thing like Jesus or the Catholic Church. So what do I mean by this? Try and have your social media be a reflection of you as a real person, not a robot or a one-trick pony. Think about it as a conversation. If you were to go and have coffee with a friend, and through the entire conversation, you never once talked about your work, you never talked about your family, you never talked about your hobbies, all you did was talk about the Pope and how awesome the Pope was. Well, your friend might not find the conversation that enjoyable. However, if you had a normal, friendly conversation with your friend, and at certain key points incorporated just a little piece of information about your faith, I think you'd find that your friend would be more interested in learning about your faith because it is presented in a normal way amongst the rest of your conversation. Well, the same is true when it comes to social media. Don't act in a robotic way by just spamming Christian content into other people's news feeds. What you want to do is you want to be intentional about spacing your faith-based posts, or at least if you're posting just about Christian things, at least post about varying topics. So maybe something about Mary, then something about Jesus, then something about uh, the moral code uh, interacting with our culture, things like that. Try not to become a robot or someone who can't talk about anything else but faith. Try and present yourself as a real person but as a real person who has been radically transformed by Jesus. So be authentic, share things about your faith, but don't obsess over it. Does that make sense? Another thing we need to do when we are evangelizing through social media is, when in doubt, be extremely clear and extremely kind in all of your posts. And when I say be extremely clear and extremely kind, I mean do so to the point that you almost feel like you're overdoing it. So what I mean by this is be clear. Don't use Catholic lingo or jargon that people won't understand. Don't, for instance, post a picture of Our Lady of Fatima and say Our Lady of Fatima wants the world to pray the rosary and repent. Now, of course, Our Lady of Fatima does want us to pray the rosary and repent because we need to do that, but assume people don't know who Our Lady of Fatima is. Assume they don't know what the word repent means. Assume that they've never heard of the rosary. You need to clarify what you're talking about. Explain what happened at Fatima. Explain how Mary appeared to shepherd children. Explain what the rosary is. Explain what repentance means and why it's important. Assume people don't know what you're talking about, because oftentimes they don't, and it will be useless to them if you don't clarify. So clarify your posts so that there's no room for confusion, and also be kind. Be extremely kind. Avoid name-calling, sarcasm, unnecessarily inflammatory speech. Let me tell you, I have seen many Catholics on social media saying true things, for sure, talking about Jesus, talking about the Catholic faith, but they do so in an intensely antagonistic way, in a way that irritates people. And then when those people comment, they begin calling them names, making fun of them, using negative humor, and it doesn't win any converts. So be kind and be clear. Another point is this, if at all possible, try to retain your social media audience for as long as possible, even if that might irritate you. Now, what do I mean by this? I mean, if at all possible, try not to delete or block people who would otherwise be looking at your content. And this is important for two reasons. First of all, it widens the reach of the gospel, right? If you keep deleting everyone who posts something that you don't like, before you know it, you're not going to have an audience that is available to listen to the gospel that you're going to be sharing with them, right? And it also allows friends who maybe you haven't talked with in a while getting in touch with you after many years because that one post 
got to them. And I have had that happen to me. Friends who I have not talked with in years reaching out to me six, seven, eight years later and asking me about my faith, asking how they can get more connected with God. It's like playing the waiting game. But another reason it's important to hang on to your audience as long as possible is for your benefit. It gives you a window into their world. It helps you to be more relevant. It helps you to be able to reach people from different worldviews with the gospel because you already know a little bit of how they think because of what they've posted. On my Facebook, for instance, I have friends who are pagans, who are Jews, who are Buddhists, who are atheists, who are from every political stripe. And this is good for me because I see their content and I understand how they view the world. So that when I'm talking with them, I'm not coming in cold and trying to share a worldview with them in a way that they will not be under, able to understand. I'll be able to share the gospel with them in a way that they do understand because I know how they think because I've seen their posts. Does that make sense? So try to keep your audience on social media as big as possible for as long as possible to have your impact be much larger. Now, when you're using social media, if you're posting about Christian things, if you're posting about Jesus or the gospel, something about the Catholic faith, the post in and of itself is a kind of outreach, right? Because people are reading the post, but you also need to understand that the dialogue, the comments that happen afterwards are also very important because what these can do is they can serve as a kind of written debate. Even if you're not arguing with someone, whatever happens in the comments is visible to everyone else. And normally, at least this is what I've experienced, normally, if you are debating something about apologetics, for instance, some truth of the faith that you're defending, normally you won't convert the person that you're speaking with, at least not in public. They're not going to agree that you're right. They won't admit it. But remember that other people who maybe have never liked the post, never commented, are reading those comments. I remember uh, Scott Klusendorf, a famous pro-life apologist. I was learning from him how to run public debates. He was teaching at a lecture and he said, you're not there to convert the person you're debating. You're there to convert the audience. And that always stuck with me because the same thing is true with social media. You could be debating some truth of the faith with someone and going back and forth, and you might never convert that person. But all of your other friends are reading those comments and you are trying to reach them. So always remember that all elements of your post are important the post itself, and the comments. Now, when someone privately messages you, some of the different social media sites have this function where they can privately message you without anyone else knowing, take that as a real opportunity because it's showing vulnerability on their part and because they're meeting you in secret away from the public eye, away from public scrutiny. It's like their Nicodemus moment in John chapter three, verses one and two. Nicodemus, who's a leader of the Jews, comes to Jesus at night in secret in order to talk with Jesus out of the view of his friends in order to meet Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. And we know that later Nicodemus converts that he becomes a believer in Christ, probably from that opportunity of vulnerability one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. And so if someone privately messages you, take that as a real opportunity to share the gospel with them, to talk about Jesus with them one-on-one. -on -one. I remember once I posted something about pro-life work that I was doing in Detroit. And a friend of mine who I had not talked with in years messaged me privately and said that one of her friends had just gotten pregnant and was planning an abortion. And she said, seeing my post convinced me I needed to message you. And so I was able to chat with her over message get her friend some help and her friend ended up choosing life and a baby's life was saved in a different country because of a social media post. Now she never liked it. She never commented. There was nothing public, but privately behind the scenes in the private messages, conversations were happening that saved a life. So don't despair 
if you don't see many people commenting because it's really important to be having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people for their Nicodemus moment. Now, despite all of these tips, I do want to have, uh, advise you not to get sucked in to letting this form of ministry on social media take over your life. Because like all things, balance is key and social media can have a very addictive quality. So I do want to warn you that some of the warning signs of getting addicted to social media is you start ignoring your duties, responsibilities, or healthy real world activities, actually seeing people face to face. If you start ignoring that, that could be a sign of becoming addicted to social media and you might need to step back. If you become obsessed with getting likes or reposts or views, or your mood begins to change depending on how all of this goes, that could be another warning sign. Another warning sign is if trusted friends of yours or family tell you that your social media use is getting out of control. And you need to be humble and be able to accept that feedback and maybe say, maybe the Lord is telling me, even though I think I'm doing good work, by sharing the gospel online, maybe I need to take a step back. We need to be very self-aware of this and aware of the dangers that come with sharing the gospel on social media. Another thing that I want to caution you on is, if you are not already aware of this, the world of social media can be extremely cruel and downright depressing, much more so than real person encounters. And I want to tell you and give you permission to walk away from obstinate or abusive people online because they are out there. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, Jesus gives this advice to his disciples. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. And how true this is of social media, that you could present people with a charitable, honest, and loving message of the gospel, sharing something about your faith, and people will turn and attack you and discredit you. I have had to block people who have threatened my life on social media, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with walking away from those kinds of people, cutting that out of your life. And you need to be aware that that does happen on social media. And so we need to be aware of these things before we get involved. Now, certain people will have a certain gift, a charism for online evangelization. And maybe that's you. And if so, then what you need to do is develop it and use it for the spread of the kingdom. But even if you don't feel like you have that specific calling, it is still possible for you to use your social media sites, whatever you have, to share the gospel with an entirely new audience who might never have heard it otherwise. For instance, they don't go to church, they don't hang out with Christian friends, or even they don't want to be publicly seen going to a retreat or an event about Jesus, but they are willing to look at it behind a screen in secret. They're open. And those are the people who we can reach online in a way that we could never reach them initially in person. Now, above all, when you're evangelizing on social media, you need to let your presence witness to Christ. Whether you're talking with someone in person or on social media, let everything you do manifest not yourself and the world, but manifest Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul writes, be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. How true that is of social media. Let your persona, your platform, be blameless and innocent. Shine in the midst of a world of social media that can be crooked and perverse and wicked, but shine as a light in order to preach the gospel to a people that might never hear it otherwise. Amen? Well, we've reached the end of our time now, but hopefully something in this show has taught, equipped, or empowered you for the mission of the new evangelization so that you can go out and set the world on fire for Jesus.